How to good be? How to good be? How to be a good DM? All right, I see this question a lot. I see this question all the time. So let's let's talk about it. What do you need to be a good dungeon master? Whether it be in any TTRPG, it doesn't have to be Dungeons and Dragons. It's just the one I focus on, but. These are universal. The, you can even apply these to things that aren't game-related. This this stuff will work in your real life. Um, I got a quick top five. I know there's lots of top fives that are, are generally done uh, for these things, but I'm going to go a little bit of a step further. This video is going to cover just the, the, the top five things that I think are useful and, and helpful, whereas... Once this video is complete, that'll give you a rough overview of each of those things. There will then be a follow-up video for each one, so check the annotations and check the description below. Um, as I get to each one of these, there should be a corresponding video that will go in a, a little bit more in-depth uh, to each thing, as well as how to then apply it to your game or apply it to an in-real-life situation, so that way you can you can take these yeah and put it on your resume. So let's let's just dive right. Let's roll initiative. Communication. Communication is probably one of the more important ones. Uh, a DM needs to understand that they're not just communicating themselves or talking to themselves. They're talking to players, but they're also talking to characters. So it's up to the DM to be able to communicate between DM to player character to character and player to player and all the other corresponding ones like dm to to character and and a dm's character to a player character or a dm character to a dm character or a player character to a to a player to a dm it's there's there's a lot of moving parts and if you can keep track of that and sort of understand how your individual players communicate themselves because not everybody communicates the same way then you're going to have an, a lot easier time. If you also understand how you communicate as as a person, that will help you immensely in your day-to-day -day life, but also in helping other people understand you. So whether or not it's making players, whether or not it comes to confrontation, uh, whether it be in-character confrontation or player confrontation, or you've just got a player who's trying to, you know, wreck your good old time... Um, a lot of that stuff isn't usually intentional, so if you know how to communicate or at least recognize uh, different tells on different players about whether or not people are uncomfortable, you're going to have a lot easier of a time. Improv. Being able to improv is very, very, very helpful for a dungeon master. Um, if you can think on your feet and sort of come up with uh, come up with a, a character or a person on the fly, sometimes it's handy to have like a backlog of NPCs or a backlog of just traits or little mini stories that you can throw on any character. Super duper helpful. It's also really helpful if you have uh, a player that can't make it that day, if you can sort of improv a situation that delays the party for whatever reason, or if you have um, uh, a combat, you can, if, if you are, can improv a way either around the combat, or if you can improv a way to um, adjust, uh, adjust your combat so that way it's still well scaled and well balanced. Um, being able to improv different rules and problem solving or utilizing different rules to solve problems, very, very helpful. And, you know, it's nice to be quick-witted. It makes for fun, some fun role-playing situations. Um, this is just a general, useful, charismatic thing to be able to do, even in your real life. If you can kind of think around um, uh, people's, people's problems or people's issues, it's super handy-dandy. Um, flexibility is the next one. Um, being able to bend the rules is very useful. Being able to bend the rules without breaking them, very handy. Uh, being flexible in your schedule as well to be able to meet with players. Because um, sometimes people need to meet and talk 
um, about what their player, uh, like what their characters are doing or whatever is going on in their life. They're going to miss some sessions, whatever. Being creative is part of flexibility, in my opinion, being able to create maps um, and monsters and encounters and being flexible about how you utilize them. So if you see somebody's map that you really, really like uh, and you want to use it, but it's an underground map, just reflavor it. Just, just reflavor it. Uh, same with spells. If somebody wants to be able to cast like the equivalent of a fireball, but they want it to be acid, just reflavor it to acid. Be, be flexible about stuff like that. Um, railroading is something that that comes with flexibility. Uh, you want the players to go in a specific direction, but you need to be flexible enough that you're able to sort of bend around what they want to do, so they can you can incorporate that into whatever it is that you're whatever direction you want them to go in so it you might still be kind of railroading them you still got you still have them on a path but they won't know the illusion of choice handy dandy um, as well as being flexible when it comes to encounters and monsters not every encounter needs to be um a, char- a charisma one or solving an encounter isn't always about lying. It might be about intimidation. It might be about nature checks, right? So being flexible in the way the characters uh, try to solve try to solve a problem, it's super super helpful. As well as, oh, I I've seen people complaining that there's not enough celestials uh, in the monster manual, like the standard monster manual. Uh, one of the easiest ways to um, to solve a problem like that, if you just don't have enough of a, of a specific breed of monster, take stat blocks from other monsters that are similar and just tweak them a little bit, reflavor them. It'll get you exactly what you need. Flexibility will save you in so many instances. Of course, as soon as I start recording, Puck decides that he wants to start being a butt. Thanks, buddy. Organization. Um... Prep your work. Uh, I I am a very low prep person. Right? I don't, as a DM, I don't do a lot of preparation for my sessions. Um, I know where I want to go, and then I just have sort of a backlog of stuff. And depending on what the players decide to do, they'll run into different things, whatever I think is appropriate. So I have kind of like a grab bag. So I have a grab bag of maps. I have a grab bag of encounters. I have a grab bag of NPCs and and, and, and locations, right? So the story doesn't tend to change too much. Like the overarching themes remain the same, but it doesn't ultimately matter what direction the players go because I the way I've got my stuff organized means that they can do whatever they want and it doesn't upset the overall issues of, of what's happening. Um, taking notes and, and having your, have however that be for you. Um, sticky notes I find is really helpful. Having sticky notes in my, um, my, my player's handbook or my DMG that has like, hey, this is spells. Hey, this is, this is the page where spells starts. Oh, this is the page where equipment is. Oh, this is the page where, like where all those chapters kind of flip over. I find is really helpful because it helps you find Whatever rules you're looking for, you're looking for combat rules. You've got a you got a little sticky note tab, handy handy dandy. Um, keeping your maps organized is a I struggle with that one, but if you can keep that stuff like in like tubes, <laughs> or like if you have like a I don't know if you're working digitally and you can keep your stuff organized in files, that's handy dandy. But if you're in real life, I mean, good luck because those maps get big. Um, I like to take pictures of them. Um, have a little like some of the players' information. Um, off to the side so like you don't necessarily have to ask for what their ac is all the time or what their passive perception is all the time so you kind of have like some of their stats off to the side just that that'll that'll just save you a whole lot of time and and trouble and you can just keep it right on your dm screen um and like i like i said i have a stack of like npcs so if i ever need an npc i just whip one out and i'm just like yo this is greg he's a blacksmith (laughs) <laughs> I don't know. The last one, and I think the one that is probably like the 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 biggest one that's probably going to end up taking two videos to kind of dive into, is game conceptualization. So a lot of people will 
if you're starting off being a DM, you're like, well, I don't know the rules very well, or, oh, I'm really, uh, I'm not very knowledgeable about lore, or I don't know all the character classes super duper well. You don't need to know that. Um, when I say game conceptualization, what I mean is understanding how the game functions on a fundamental level. So you understand you're using a D20 and why you're using a D20 and what that sort of means. So you don't necessarily need to know what the, the, dice challenge level is for every kind of door so you don't like if the door is wood or if the door is made of stone or if the door is made of mithril it's going to have different durability to get through you don't need to know what the exact dc is for all of them but if you understand fundamentally that one door is going to be more difficult to get through than the other door and you have a good understanding of how to scale what is difficult and what is not there there are charts for this in the dmg if you've got that chart you're good to go. Challenge ratings in Monster Manual when it comes to encounter building is difficult to finagle sometimes, and sometimes it just does not scale very well, um, depending on how you use those monsters. But just rem if you can remember that conceptually the idea is that how difficult is each monster to hit on that 20 scale... So, I mean, I'm I'm going to get into that, like, sort of more of what the concept of the game is in the video about this. But as long as you understand, like, you know, you, you understand what a blast versus a cone is in spellcasting, you don't need to know every single spell or what level it is. You can always just double check that. But if you have a core understanding of, like, which schools of magics do what and what a cast time actually is and what an action is and what a reaction is you'll like from a core functionality standpoint you're perfectly fine the lore you you'll catch up the what players are capable of that's their job they can read their their character sheet when it comes to rules i i do rec like you'll learn them as you go and if you make mistakes it's it's fine it's not a big deal um i'm somebody who believes that if you're going to bend the rule, you need to understand the rule you're bending before you do so. Because if you start bending something you don't understand, you might break it and you might end up breaking it in a way that makes your game really inconsistent or difficult to play or difficult to understand, which you don't want. So my, my recommendation is to, you know, you can learn the rules as you go and take your time, but if you're organized enough and you're able to communicate and you're willing to be flexible and you can kind of think on your feet a little bit, you'll be able to just flip to that part of the book and just double check it. Um, if you end up with character players that, that like to argue rules a lot, I mean, that's going to be up to you with what you want to allow at your table. Um, and I'll probably get to get to that in another video where I just sort of talk about what what rules do DMs tend to like, tend to use, what works for them, and what 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 doesn't? Um, I mean, I have my own sets of rules. If you decide to do something or change a rule or adjust a rule, there's no problem with that. But write it down. And so, if you're if a player's like, "Hey, I want to do this," and you're like, "Yeah, okay, that's fine," write down that they've done it because if they can do it, you can do it as the DM, which which opens that door to all of the enemies. And on top of that, if you're homebrewing something, like I homebrew uh, crit critical strikes, for example, but I write down how I do crits so that way when a crit happens, everybody knows how they work. So there's not a whole nother discussion every single session about, well, how are we treating crits again? Are we doing them this way or this way? Which would you prefer? Both? Both. Both. Both is good. So... There's nothing wrong with changing rules or bending rules or making rules, whatever you want them to be. Just as, as long as they're consistent, it's really not a problem. But those are my quick top five things that will help you be a better DM. And like and subscribe and follow and make sure you hit the bell because there's going to be um, longer videos for each one. Uh, like Each one is going to get its own video, basically. Um, and I look forward to seeing you there. Um, happy launching of... Uh, of a goblin's lair. Have a good day, everybody.